All right. In the Gospels, Jesus talks a lot about the kingdom of God to his disciples and to the wider crowds around. And sometimes he just speaks plainly. Other times he speaks in parables and he uses those to help unpack the nature of the kingdom. Some of the parables he gives us the interpretation for, which is really helpful. Thank you, Lord. That's nice and clear. Sometimes he doesn't give us the interpretation. And today we're looking at a parable where he doesn't give us the interpretation. So we need to try and find out what is it he's saying. And one of the things I love about the parables is is that because they get stuck in your head and they get stuck in your heart as you wrestle with them and you try and peel back the layers and find what's really at the heart and at the center. It's a search. I'm one of those people uh, who goes on a mad rampage when I can't find something. Like if I put two socks in the washing machine, I get two socks out, I hang two socks up, and then when I go to put them away, there's one sock. Like that will send me completely over the edge, you know, completely berserk. I'll be searching the house, I'll be turning everything upside down, going on a mad rampage, ransacking the drawers, because it's the mystery of it. The sock was there and now it's gone. You know, Sam couldn't care less about the socks. He often just wears a short sock and a long sock. <laughs> Like, what has he got on today? If it's a pear, it'll be a miracle, that's for sure. Because he doesn't even really do pears. But I will literally turn the house upside down till I find the sock. Sadly, it's an inherited trait. So my children probably will have exactly the same. My mum is all kinds of crazy when she loses something. And when I turned up at her house this week, she was on a mad rampage looking for a pin cushion. Dad was involved. They're looking under everything, behind everything. Then I got involved. It just went on and on. And, you know, if I've, if I've lost it for long enough and I'm really feeling annoyed, I will simply ring mum and tell her I've lost it and then I can just sit back, just like watch her go. And she'll just, you know, she'll burrow around. Eventually she will track down that sock. And I think that's what's so exciting about the parables because it is a search. For those of us who love a mystery, it is a mystery. You've got to find it. You've got to search it out. You've got to look behind things. You've got to turn things upside down. And so for those of you who haven't delved into the parables, I want to encourage you to do so because there's just so much in them. Bruxy Cavey says this, part of the process of a parable is that it ignites a conversation that is healthy for your spiritual development. So the parable that we're looking at today is all about the kingdom of God. In the Bible, Paul uses three primary images to teach the early church and us about the kingdom of God. And the images that he uses are citizens, soldiers, and ambassadors. They're really strong images, but there's a gentleness about the way he uses them. And Braxy Cavey puts it like this. You can see it up on the slide. As citizens of the kingdom, we contribute. We're active members forming the culture, not sitting back passively, but we want to be involved to give joyfully and willfully time, money and energy into kingdom activities. As soldiers of the kingdom, we advance. We fight not against people, but against the kingdom of darkness. And we advance forward, taking territory, not through force, but through reconciliation. Just so beautiful. And then as ambassadors of the kingdom, we represent the policies of the king and our kingdom to a foreign nature. We come on behalf of the kingdom of God. God's kingdom could be seen as a really aggressive image with this militaristic language. But then Jesus comes and he tells a parable and he tells us that the kingdom of God is not aggressive. It is slow and quiet and gentle. So we're looking today at the parable of the mustard seed. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Mark 4, verse 30 to 32. Jesus says this, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we, we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. As I've researched about the mustard seed over the years, I've been inspired by the findings of Bruxy Cavey. If you haven't heard of him, go and Google him, listen to some of his talks. Shane Claiborne, who wrote Irresistible Revolution, and also Susie Silk. So I'm going to be drawing from those threes, three as, as I continue. We may not be very familiar with mustard. When I think of mustard, I think of American hot dogs. Who loves those? 
Yes, Luke does. And I think of Colonel Mustard in the library with the candlestick. Cluedo. But I think what we need to remember is that first century Jews would have been very familiar with mustard because it was, would have been growing in the wild all around them. They would have known mustard really well, and so they would have grasped the symbolism. What's amazing is that we can learn so much about the kingdom of God by looking at mustard. So the first thing is mustard is small but strong. Mustard seeds are tiny, but they're hugely powerful. They're only one millimeter in diameter, but when they're planted and they grow, they're actually strong enough to cover mountainsides, to smother trees and crack the concrete. Mustard was known to grow like a wild bush and, and it was just notorious for invading gardens and taking over till all that was left was mustard. The Jews highly valued order. And so in some places it was actually illegal to plant mustard because it was known to just take over and kill all the other plants. So let that sink in for just a minute. Here Jesus likens the kingdom of God to an illegal weed. It's something subversive, but once it's planted, yeah, well, one, di different weed, but different weed, people. Who went there? Oh my goodness. Man, I didn't. I must be pure as the driven snow, eh? I didn't even go there. But he does. He likens it to, likens it to an illegal weed, and, and it's subversive, but once it's planted, massive growth is inevitable. We often look down on small things. We get frustrated over things that take time. I know I do. We are bombarded with the lie that bigger and is always better and faster is better. We love supersizing things. You know, my husband gets extremely excited about an oversized meal. <laughs> I know most of you do, you know, we love that, we love instant gratification, but Jesus reminds us, don't despise small things. Don't despise things that take time. Don't underestimate the power of small things. He uses mustard to describe God's kingdom subtly taking over the world, and it starts from small slow, insignificant beginnings. Think of Jesus' own ministry. It was only three short years in one small area of the world. And here we are, 2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. Our lives have been changed. The lives of those all across the world have been changed from such a small time in one small place. The environment that Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God in is politically charged. He's talking about the kingdom. Israel is under Roman rule. So they're oppressed by the Romans. And they are waiting for a Messiah. They've been praying, seeking God. They're waiting for God to come in great power and great might and just crush their enemies. They can't wait to see them stamp down. But Jesus doesn't say that. He says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed slow, gentle. He sees exactly the opposite of what they're hoping. And so God's power comes in gentleness, not in striving, but in gentle, slow, consistent growth. The kingdom that Jesus is ushering in is one of love, hope, joy, and peace. And as followers of Jesus, we are called to usher in that same kingdom in the way that we live and the way that we love. So often we can feel too small, too insignificant, too unnoticed to really make a difference for God's kingdom. But God has the power to take something tiny and make it huge. He has the power to take something that feels like a random moment and turn it into a pivotal event. It is not about how clever, how smart, how strategic we are. It is all about how awesome the God is that we love and serve. In the Old Testament, there's a passage that I wasn't very familiar with before really looking at the heart of mustard. And it's in Zechariah, the Israelites have been in exile and they're allowed to return. And so they return and they start rebuilding the temple. But they're feeling discouraged because they're looking at the temple and some of them are rem remembering what Solomon's temple used to look like. And they're comparing it. And, you know, comparison steals joy. It just steals our joy. And for the Israelites, they're looking at their work and they're weeping. 
because it just doesn't look as grand as Solomon's temple. But then in Zechariah 14, it says, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. And they don't know it yet, but Jesus is going to walk in that temple. God knows what's ahead. The people don't know, so they're discouraged. But he says, don't be discouraged. I'm rejoicing in what you're doing. He's rejoicing because he's seeing the first stone being laid. Many of you are serving faithfully. You're loving others. You're seeking God. You're praying for those in your family. And you're wondering if anything that you're doing is even effective. Is it even making a difference? Well, I'm telling you today that God rejoices in it. He sees the stones being laid. They may be small. It may feel like hard work. It may be slow going, but you're building for God's kingdom, and it is a beautiful thing. I went to a conference once years ago, and the speaker said, I want you to think of someone, a person, an actual human being, who is most like God. And so everyone sort of spent some time doing that. And then we all sort of said who it was. And the overwhelming majority said Mother Teresa. When we got to the heart of it, it was because of the way that she loved. She didn't just love and look after one person. She loved and looked after hundreds, possibly thousands of people. It was on such a huge scale. And we're all in awe of the magnitude of her ministry and the size of her heart. But she started very simply. She started with one person. For her, it all started the first time she took a homeless person home to her house for a meal. That's how it started, with one person. And then day by day, week by week, year by year, one foot in front of the other, seeking God, trusting God in the highs and lows, loving the sick, looking after the poor, year in, year out, and all of a sudden heaven is breaking into earth and there's ripples in her, of her ministry are going far and wild, wide and we are still affected by her ministry today. The ripples are still going and it started so small and so simply. She calls her road the little road, which I just love. And she says this, this little road means that you serve God by doing the most common down to earth work as well as you can with everything that you have. The good news today is that we can do that. We can do that. We're called to build the kingdom in our families, in our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our communities, and we can do that. This church community is filled with people who are doing just that, who are loving their neighbours, who are opening their homes and showing hospitality, who are taking those in that are on the outskirts, loving the waifs and the, and the strays. You know, we've got people here that are working with those that society has forgotten. So I just want to encourage you this morning, Bay Vineyard, the little things that you do matter. The little things are right at the heart of the kingdom of God. Do not be discouraged. God can and will do big, beautiful things with your very small offering. When you come to him with humility and you come with surrender and you offer it to him, he will do beautiful things with it. Before we moved to the Hawke's Bay, we were part of a church in Christchurch called a Grace Vineyard. And Grace has a trust that is attached. It's called Compassion Trust. Now, when we were there, Compassion Trust uh, were doing awesome things. That it was cranking. But I looked back at the history of Compassion Trust, and it started very simply. It started with one couple who wanted to bless the community. And, and they thought, well, what can we do? Well, why don't we do a meal? And so they thought, okay, they got together a few volunteers, and they put on a community meal. And the very first meal had 33 people, and that's how it started. Fast forward many years, and now Compassion Trust has lots of staff, and they are blessing and loving hundreds and hundreds of people every single year. They run budgeting courses, deliver school lunches, they help feed the homeless, they run community lunches, they run social clubs, support the elderly, support single parents, support widows, and the list goes on and on. In 2019, volunteers spent 237 hours just moving furniture, gardening, and doing odd jobs to help others. Ah, oh, it's so inspiring and it started so small, but it's growing like a mustard seed. And here's the exciting thing. Here at Bay Vineyard, we now have a trust. 
You might have heard Sam talking about it from the front. Manawa Oratras, meaning breath of life. And it's tiny right now. It's a mustard seed. You can barely see it. We have come up against some challenges as we've tried to plan things. But, you know, we're not losing faith. We're not losing hope. We've got a team who have a heart and a vision for the community here in the bay. And so we would love you to join with us and pray that one day this will grow like mustard, that one day we will be loving and blessing and serving hundreds in the, in the community through this trust. This parable urges us on. I think that's why I love it. It is so encouraging, and I've come back to it time and again because it warns us, don't dismiss what seems unimpressive. Don't dismiss what seems small. None of us are too small. None of us are too unnoticed. None of us are too weak or anxious or scared to be used for God's kingdom. Charles Colson says this, one of the most wonderful things about being a Christian is that I don't ever get up in the morning and wonder if what I do matters. I live every day to the fullest because I can live it through Christ. And I know no matter what I do today, I'm going to do something to advance the kingdom of God. That is what living in him looks like. So cool. All right, the second thing is mustard grows in secret. When the mustard seed first starts growing into the plant, it does so in secret. It does it deep in the earth. You can't see anything happening at first. You may not think anything's happening, but there's something going on under the surface. And then all of a sudden, the mustard seed gets activated by the sun and by the water, and then it starts to sprout, and then it explodes. And it is the same when we, when we plant seeds for his kingdom. We may not see anything at first. We may think nothing's happening under the surface. But we have to trust that when we plant something and we water it with prayer, it gets activated by the Holy Spirit and something is growing. I spent years of my life walking away from Jesus. And when I look back over those years now, I just see so many people that planted seeds for his kingdom in my heart. You know, every time you show love, hospitality or kindness, you plant a seed for God's kingdom. Every time you put someone else's needs before your own, you, you plant a seed for God's kingdom. You may not see anything happening. It may be under the surface, but it's growing. Something's happening. Every time you show forgiveness, every time you show grace, every time you show mercy, you plant a seed for God's kingdom. Don't be discouraged if you've been praying for the same stuff year in, year out, and you're not seeing growth. Something is happening in the quiet, silent space. God is working on it. There is just no rush in that process it takes time for a seed to come to fruition. So we just got to give, we got to give time for the seed to grow. We have to give time for God to do his work. So I was looking back on that time in my life where, where it didn't feel like much was happening, but God was planting kingdom seeds. And I was reminded of a friend. I had a friend who used to give me prophetic words. Whenever I saw her, she would speak God's truth over me. She would remind me who God created me to be. And in doing that, a silent seed for God's kingdom was planted in my heart. I had a really healing encounter with my arch nemesis from high school. And uh, I hadn't seen her for years. It felt like a very divine appointment. And I was at a very low ebb. And what was amazing was she was the one who ministered grace and forgiveness and love to me. And she directly pointed me to Jesus because she was a Christian. And again, a silent seed for his kingdom was planted in my heart. I had a really awful paranoid episode once when I was high as a kite after smoking drugs at a party, which... I don't recommend, okay, just getting that out there. It wasn't fun. And, and in that moment, which was just so awful, one of my non-Christian friends, who was a raging atheist, he picked up a guitar and he just started strumming it and singing to me, and he started singing about Jesus. It was the weirdest thing. I didn't even know he knew any songs about Jesus, but he did. And as he sang, I, I felt... I felt all the fear and the darkness just lift over me, like be sucked off me. And then I felt this beautiful, gentle, comforting presence, the presence of God, rest on me. And it wasn't the presence of anger. 
It was the presence of love. And again, a silent seed was just planted in my heart for God's kingdom. I had a friend who used to remind me every time he, he saw me that he was praying for me through all the tumultuous years and I'm living like a complete little hooligan and he says, oh, I'm praying for you and he's just speaking love and grace into my life. And again, a silent seed is planted for his kingdom. And then, you know, my mum's probably thinking nothing's happening. She's praying for me day in, day out. And, and I tell you what happened. One day I just woke up and where all those seeds had been planted, it was like a massive tree had grown in my heart. And there was, you know, there was just no denying the presence of God in my life. And it was all those seeds that were planted. And, and I'm so grateful for those who were planting seeds. 1 Corinthians 3, 7. I love this verse. It says, Neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, only God who makes things grow. We plant the seeds, the Holy Spirit will activate them. The growth may not be in our timing. It may not look like we're expecting it to look or wanting it to look. But we can trust that God is doing something in the secret place. So don't be discouraged if you're planting seeds and you're not seeing the growth. Plant them. Water them with prayer and trust that the Holy Spirit is growing them. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you for your encouragement. (laughs) You know, just like we can plant kingdom seeds in people's heart, God will plant seeds for the kingdom in our heart, but we've got to give him space. If we get up in the morning and we open his word, or if we set aside time in the day to just pray, to be in his presence, to hear from him, He will plant those seeds in us. The kingdom advances in us first and then through us. And we see the fruit from it. We see our peace and joy increases. Our character is challenged, but then it becomes refined. We see ourselves being transformed more and more into his glory. And yes, we still make mistakes. We still fall fall short. But we're growing. That's the main thing. We're growing like a seed. And it's a long process So much of it goes on in the quiet, secret place underneath the earth. You know, I was lamenting to Marie the other day. Marie's out with the kids right now. But I was saying, oh, I had the most amazing quiet time this morning. Got up early. Ah, it was good. It felt great. Had a worship time in the car. Really felt the presence of God, the Holy Spirit resting on me. Felt so grateful. Got home within five minutes. I'm being snippy. I'm being rude. I'm being horrible. And and I'm having to repent and apologize. And then it's like, oh, Lord, have mercy on me. What is wrong with me? You know, I've just had this beautiful time. And it, it can be discouraging. But you know what? I trust God's mercy and I trust his process. He is growing stuff in me. He's growing fruit in me, even when I make the mistakes. You know, I'm not ripe yet, but I'm getting riper day by day. We all are. We're getting riper. We're not ready to be picked, but one day we will be ready to be picked. And there's just no shortcuts. Over the years following Jesus, slowly but surely, my life is getting taken over by his kingdom. Greg Boyd said, just as God's kingdom begins as a mustard seed and slowly grows to take over the whole earth, so the kingdom begins as a mustard seed in our own life and gradually grows to take over our entire existence. We become citizens of the kingdom the moment we genuinely surrender our lives, but we experience and manifest the true life of the kingdom as we learn to yield to him on a daily basis. Amen. It's a lifelong journey. More and more as the kingdom of God breaks into my life, I feel Jesus invading my entire existence. And I know you guys are experiencing the same. He gets into one area and then all of a sudden he's jumped over into the next area and then he's taking over the next area. He deals with our failures and our faults gently. I feel him putting his finger on the things in me that he wants to deal with, you know, one at a time, gently, in his timing. There's just no shortcuts. He slowly waters and he tends the seeds and he encourages us more and more into freedom. So wherever you are on the journey, 
whether you feel like you're stumbling along, whether you feel like you've had a week of failures, whether you feel like you're cranking it, wherever you are, He is doing something in you. He is growing something under the surface in the secret place. You may not see it, it's there, it's growing. You can trust in it, trust in His goodness. Continue to trust and surrender to Him and one day you will be a fruity old person. You will be fruity with ever increasing peace and joy. That's my prayer. Yes, come Lord. The next thing we can learn is mustard is potent. Mustard is known for its intense flavor. But if you were to just take a mustard seed, swallow it whole, you're not going to you you just you're not going to experience the intensity of the flavor. Mustard has to be crushed, it has to be broken, it has to be ground down in order for the flavor and the potency to be released. So Jesus turns things upside down here. He's saying, my power is not in the crushing, it's in the being crushed. Likewise, our power is not in the crushing, it's it's in the being crushed. We come with weaknesses, we walk with limps, we've got faults. God wants to move us to healing and wholeness, but none of us are too broken to be used by God right here, right now. You know, none of us are too small and too broken to be powerful for God. When I think of someone who got really crushed, when I think in the Bible, I think of Peter. So Peter was one of Jesus' best buddies, one of his beloved disciples. And we all love Peter because he's this man of great passion and great courage. And, you know, he, he, he speaks a big talk, he walks a big walk. And the thing with Peter is he's the one who has the faith to step out of the boat. He's the one who Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. And Peter makes these big promises. You know, he's always up for an adventure and he says, I will never deny you, you know. And then, well, we know what happens because Peter's passion gets him into trouble. He's got a big ego at times and he just can't follow through on his promises. And when it comes to it, Peter denies Jesus three times. And at that point, Peter is crushed. He's broken. He's been ground down. And he, he probably feels really worthless. He feels like he's just a big drop kick. And then what we see is Jesus restores him. Jesus redeems him. And it's a hard road for Peter, but there is good fruit that comes from it. I've got a quote here from one of my favorite preachers, Sam Harvey. Yeah. It's bound to be good. And and Sam Harvey says this. He's always harping on in my ear about it. The process of refining creates people of greater humility, greater empathy, greater reliance on God, greater depth in our walk with Him. If we choose Him in the pain rather than trying to run or anesthetize the pain, it will result in greater peace, greater depth, and a reorientation of our priorities. We will be more like Jesus, the one broken and crushed for us all. It is good. You know, Peter still has his passion at the end of it. He still has that call on his life to leadership that was so evident. But what he has now is he has these attributes. He has these as well. And it's after this brokenness that you see the real power and the potency released in Peter. And if you look in Acts 2 in the early church, he stands up in front of the crowd. He's like a new man. And the power and passion for Jesus is released. It's actually in his broken experiences that his potency for God is released. It's when Peter dies to himself in order to be reborn and live through Jesus that his power is released. And then Peter is the one who goes on to write such beautiful words. 1 Peter 5, 7, he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And then in in verse 7, one of my life verses, Cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That comes from the heart of Peter after he has been crushed, after that power has been released. If we think back to the mustard plant, if a mustard seed remains on the plant, then it just remains one single seed. But if the seed falls off the plant and dies, then it becomes many seeds. And so the kingdom of God erupts out of weakness. 
That's how it does it. It comes, it erupts out of weakness. And as we die to ourselves and we start to live for Jesus and we start to live for those around us, then the power is released. You know, many of us have just had a hard year. You know, we've had a rubbish year. We are tired. We're worn down. Some of you are struggling financially. This year has just, it's been a slap to the face and then another slap in the other direction. And you're wondering, when is this year going to be over? You're feeling crushed. You're feeling ground down. But you know what? If you bring your vulnerabilities to God, if you continue to trust him and surrender to him through it, he will take those broken pieces. He will rebuild you just like he did Peter with a new potency, a new power for his kingdom. We need to trust in him. The last thing is mustard brings restoration. I was chatting to a friend of mine years ago about the very dynamic abilities of mustard. There are many, many dynamic abilities, as I've told you today. And, and she told me one more thing that just completely blew my mind. She grew up on a farm, and her dad was a farmer, and he used to harvest the wheat field, and then he would put down mustard seed because the mustard actually restored nutrients to the soil, and it would get the ground ready for another harvest of wheat. How amazing is that? So mustard actually brings restoration, just like the kingdom of God brings restoration to the world. If we look back at the parable in verse 32, it says, when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. Now, when we think of birds, we think of lovely things. We think of going and looking at birds in those bird-watching places or with the binoculars. I think of our tree. We've got a beautiful tree in our back garden and all the tuis come and they perch in the trees. And then the kids are always arguing over the binoculars. But it's lots of fun and we, we often count the tuis in the trees. But what we have to remember is for first century Jews, birds were bad. And Bruxy Cavey has an amazing talk on this where he actually explains about how the birds are an image of the Gentile nations. They're actually an image of the non-Jewish nations. And in Ezekiel 17, God actually prophesies about how the birds would one day come and rest in the branches of the new kingdom. But the birds had come. The Gentile nations had come. The Romans had come in and invaded. They hadn't come in peace. They had come in anger and might. And so the Israelites who were oppressed were just longing to get rid of the Romans. They wanted to get rid of the birds. They hated the birds. And so it's a really interesting symbol, actually, because the Romans, as they marched into battle, on the top of their poles, they actually had a symbol of an eagle. But... Um, Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed uh, that grows so big that it becomes the largest of the plants and the birds of the air can come and perch in the shade, that the birds can come and actually find a home. The Israelites would have been hoping and expecting that Jesus was going to say the birds will come and the trees will just whack them away or the trees will stamp them out or the trees will like grab them by the feet and just hang them upside down. But that isn't what he said. It's not what he said. He said that the, the birds are going to come and they're going to rest in the shade. They're going to find a home in the trees. And here is where kingdom culture is so incredibly radically different from the culture of the world. Because Jesus says, love your enemies. And in Luke 6, he says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. This is such a difficult teaching. It's so hard, but it's so powerful. He's saying bless. Actually speak blessing over those who mistreat you. Bless them. You don't get to choose who to bless. I'm choosing who to bless, and I want you to bless everyone. I want you to bless your friends, your families, your loved ones, and your enemies. I want you to bless everyone. It's so powerful. It's difficult. You know, it takes different shapes depending on who we're loving. We've got to love with wisdom. We've got to love with boundaries. And we love people differently depending on what's going to help them grow. But love is active. 
It doesn't just sit around. We're doing something. And so what Jesus is saying is the key to being a kingdom person is embracing the birds. It's initiating goodness and kindness to those who don't like you. You actually go and initiate kindness, step out of your comfort zone and do something nice for people who don't like you or people who who think differently to you. People who always disagree with you. Go and do something nice. Initiate goodness. It's so powerful. Braxy Cavey says this, the kingdom is for the birds, for those who don't like us and aren't like us. Oh, I just love that. For those who don't like us and aren't like us. So if we want to build the kingdom, we have to make space for those who don't like us and those who aren't like us. We've got to make space in our churches, in our communities, and in our lives. It's not just about us growing. It's about us making space for these people, those on the fringes. We are the citizens, the soldiers, and the ambassadors of God's kingdom. But God's kingdom is not a violent attack. Just like the mustard seed, it's a subtle contagion, but it spreads. It spreads one little life at a time. It spreads one little act of love at a time. It spreads one little act of forgiveness at a time. It spreads when we we hold out a hand to an enemy. It spreads. When we open our home and have people for a meal, it spreads. When we forgive, when we show grace, it spreads one little life at a time. And we have to believe that it spreads through the world just like mustard spreads through the garden. It spreads. Ah, oh, it's so good. Let's stand to our feet.